Yay. All right. Hi, everybody. This is Emily Kolenstein and Nikki Brooks here. I am the exhibitions coordinator at Maryland Hall. And I'm here to talk with one of our art of activism artists, Nikki Brooks, about her installation in, uh, in the hold of the ship in our Martino gallery. The show Art of Activism is open through February 27th, which is this Friday. And if you have a chance on Wednesday or Friday from 3.30 to 6.30 p.m., um, these are our last gallery hours for the exhibition. So we would love you guys to come and see the work. Um, we are really excited to be talking to Nikki today about her installation piece. And uh, let's get started. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being with us, Nikki. Thank you. Uh, so. Do right. I just say who I am? Yes, please. <laughs> yep. And I'm going to share my screen and start showing your um, installation so people can get a sense of what your piece is as you start talking. So go right ahead. Okay. So first off, hi, everyone. My name is Nikki Brooks. I'm a multidisciplinary artist that works specifically in installation and assemblage. Um, hold on one second, because I there we go. These works encourage the viewer to connect in forms of writing, storytelling, and shared dialogue through workshops that focus on diversity, inclusion, and truth telling and lament. So you you probably if you haven't seen the show, this is also uh, shared somewhere in the gallery, I do believe. Um, the goal of my work is always to shed uh, to use my black gaze to shed light on how whiteness has weighed on the social, economical, and physical disparity, disparities within our community, the black community, and uh, provide an illusion of comfort to draw in non-black audiences and provide that deeper window into how uh, this white, you know, layer of whiteness has remained silent and taken an offhand approach uh, to these issues that still plague our community. Uh, and in other words, I really uh, use these pieces in my work to sort of, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Uh, show people how these experiences are normalized uh, uh, to us as Black people, uh, and but yet they are also have uh, deep layers of trauma within them. So like when you're looking through this exhibition, yes, you might see uh, aesthetically uh, images of beautiful figures, um, you might see uh, furniture, you might see uh, from what the camera's showing hair and all these uh, different uh, tropes. That's what I call them, they're tropes. Uh, but un within these tropes are uh, statements, statements on, on trauma or questioning a Eurocentric ideology based around hair, based around beauty, uh, based around uh, existing in space. And that's why I use space, because space is such uh, an important uh, element to my work. Um, so I hope I didn't over talk. Emily, did you have a question there? Or? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, um, Oh, my voice is a little bit echoey, so I hope, do you hear that? No, you're fine. Okay. Um, I have a couple questions and I'm just gonna go in the order that I have them written down here. And I'm gonna, right. I'm gonna pause back um, in your space and we can turn this back on again, if, um, if it makes sense. So um, I am familiar with install art, installation art from my curatorial background, but it's somewhat of a less common uh, medium, if you will. You know, a lot of people think of 
art as one specific piece. Mm -hmm. And you have here, this entire room is a, is a work of art and there's all these different pieces inside of it. So I was wondering if you could kind of just talk a little bit about the concept of installation art and how you got into doing that yourself. Well, I can start from the latter, which is how I got into it. It was actually my professor, Renee Vanderstelt uh, from MICA, who started to introduce, uh, I think we were reading this book called uh, Ex uh, Expanding the Expanded Field. I have the book somewhere in the house, but uh, we're tracing the expanded field. Ah, got it. Um, and it. And in that book, it really, to me, inspired me. I didn't understand all the linguistics around it, but it inspired me to uh, look at how art doesn't have to be this one thing or art doesn't have to be in this formula of sculpture, painting, art can be uh, a blending of all things in one. And so um, seeing that and seeing the work of uh, artists like uh, Judy Chicago or Fred Wilson uh, or Adrian Piper, uh, to name a few, was very inspiring in seeing how sometimes the body, sometimes objects in space uh, really, uh, could tell a narrative of an experience. Mm -hmm. um, and even with Judy Chicago's work with the dinner table, it, you know, hers, where it goes over, uh, it, it's supposed to go over feminism and identity as well. Uh, so that, that's uh, the basis for why I got into installation art. What I have gathered from installation art is it is large in scale. Um, it is temporary, like this show, you know, I have to take it down on uh, after the 27th. Uh, mm -hmm. But more importantly, it's mixed media. So it's a mixture of all elements, painting, uh, things. And I think I really got that appreciation when I looked at Fred Wilson's uh, exhibit, Mining the mining the museum. I think he did that at the Baltimore Museum of Art and uh, seeing how he worked uh, that space with just using the objects. It's like he curated the objects that were already available inside the museum. And he just re, um, re uh, the, his approach to it was he redesigned the space with the objects in the space that actually belonged to the museum. And that was uh, very powerful. And he used things that weren't, uh, that were in the archives of the museum and brought them into space to tell a different story. And I think what Fred uh, went, went to was that because when he would go to uh, an art museum, he would never see his story, meaning the Black experience in art museum. So I hope I answered that. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, did. Yeah. I am I'm familiar with that exhibition uh, because the director of the curatorial program that I was a part of to get my MFA, um, the director was George Sissel and he helped Fred Wilson on that piece. And he's just yeah. an amazing person. But um, we've talked a lot about that. Um, did you go to the talk? I actually I, went to the yeah. talk with, yeah, that was an amazing talk. Really? Uh, George Cecil actually did, uh, what was it? What did he call it? Symposium on mm -hmm. the show. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was like two or three years ago at Micah. And Fred Wilson was there to talk about it. It was, oh gosh. I know. <laughs> I'll have to see if it's recorded and, and watch it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess that actually kind of perfectly blends into the next question because this is your thesis exhibition from when you were a student at MICA. Um, and I, when I, you know, you were chosen as an artist for the show by the three jurors 
um, Darren Gilliam, Tony Spencer, and Chanel Compton. Um, and then it was my job to kind of look at everybody's artwork and see what might be a cohesive fit for an eight person show. And I really felt like this of all your other work was going to just bring the entire exhibition home. And I realize now that that might've been somewhat stressful for you telling you to bring your thesis show out because that's a big deal. And that takes a lot, that's a couple of years of research and everything. Yes. So sorry that I, uh, no, <laughs> if I brought up great. any demons, but yeah. Can you talk about the program that you were in getting your MFA and how you came up with this installation and the hold of the ship for your thesis project? Wow. Oh, that's loaded. Okay. <laughs> So I will start with, um, I was having this midlife crisis anyway. And so I decided that, oh, I'll go back to art school like right before I turned 40. Uh, because I felt like I needed to reinvent myself. I feel like uh, the tools that I had acquired were needed to be updated somehow. <laughs> And I just needed someone to help me shake my mind up about my own practice and how to expand it. Like I couldn't move away from two dimensional art. Um, I kept reverting back to collage and portrait and not really diving in what my voice was trying to say. So that is the reason for me going back to Micah in the program that I was in was the Masters of Fine Arts program, low studio residency at MICA, which is a program in which you stay during the summer. You get two studios, which was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Two, two studios, that, in what world? Uh, to really just uh, chop out your practice, like really examine what it is you do. The professors, I call them like, Morpheus from Matrix, like the professors that I had there really uh, forced you to look at, you know, not only did you look at other artists, but you looked at uh, different movements. Uh, I also was able to put my voice in it, being like the only Black student in my cohort. It was not hard, you know, it was, you know, I didn't overlook it because I'm like, you know, I'm the only chocolate drop in this cohort. <laughs> so I, I, it then gave me, made me feel empowered to question the institution about why that was. And so it was wonderful that uh, what I can say is our experiences were an exchange. Uh, I was exchanging you know, from my lens, what I was feeling about the things I was learning, I was questioning why I just learned that when so many of us exist. And then in turn, uh, they were giving me the tools and helping me see the artists uh, from my community that I did not see often reflected in the pedagogy when you're talking about art. Uh, itself. So it kind of was like a, it was like a back and forth exchange. And um, it is so hard to get, you know, John Penny to move, but he wrote me this very moving letter at the end of my uh, school year. It, it, it was very sweet. It was, you know, saying how I had inspired, you know, just telling me how me in doing that inspired him and I'm like then he retired <laughs> but but I was like uh it just felt so good because I'm like John was like a a, a walking encyclopedia thesaurus who had met every art critic like Greenberg uh, he was very familiar with all the art movements before and I and, I, and his depth of field and knowledge in that was like amazing. And then Renee was his counter, uh, Renee uh, Vanderstilt, who I often mentioned, she was 
a walking encyclopedia of art. And, and, and when I say live, breathe, drink, think art, that's that's what they are like. Um, and so it was a it was a wonderful exchange of ideals. I won't say I have all the answers as the artist, as an artist, because I don't. But I do now have a direction and pathway in which I can go. I'm no longer scared to take these risks and chances in my work that I would have been, uh, that I wouldn't have done before. I wouldn't have taken risks like this. And so my thesis show was a gigantic risk. And um, I channeled in into narratives of growing up, narratives from my mother, stories about my grandmother and her resilience. So resilience really plays into all of this. And then while being in the program, my mother passes away. So then I get all these, uh, I have all these guardians that I'm beginning to make before her passing. And you this know, is one right here on the screen. Yeah, but, <clears throat> right, but the one that she saw was on the other wall, <clears throat> which is the long one. <clears throat> and that's the one I, I first, that was the first garden. And so I, I dedicated that to her um, because of her sacrifices, her love, you know, <clears throat> that's, that's my Aunt Pauline. It's the one when you walk right into the room and you look to your right. Yeah, right here. Right there, that one. Um, yeah. her. So um, <clears throat> let me do that again. So that was my that was dedicated to my mom. Mm -hmm. the, well, the one you can't see the top of. <laughs> and the other one, that one is the, dedicated to my Aunt Pauline. Because right before my mother died, a year before my Aunt Pauline passed, like my aunts and them have been like a, such a driving force. In, in our lives, Aunt Pauline was very uh, strong in expressing beauty and strength and grace. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I felt it very important that, you know, how do I honor these women? I turn them into guardians. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, and uh, as I'm, I'm pushing play on the video so we can kind of talk through it as it goes through. So you have... Uh, the, this is kind of about your grandmother, right? That piece right there? The shelter, but I was also questioning, um, well, the record player to start with that, you can pause it right there, is because my wife and I uh, did a podcast called Black Woman's Aesthetic. We do have one season. It is good. <laughs> it was a little choppy on sound, but a lot of people, we had a lot of people, I think we had about what? 5,000 people listen. I was like, that's not wow. bad. Wow. Yeah, so uh, you can always go to um, Black the Black Woman Aesthetic podcast. And you can find it on Google uh, Play or wherever you listen to podcasts. So you can hear the first season. And so my wife was like, you know, experience. When talking about experience. So the original show had soul music playing in the atmosphere. So not only, you know, when you walked in, you were like, you know, so people, I was, I was really shedding on them layers of comfort. Uh, because, but the 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 music, the 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 songs that I chose were really strategic because some of those songs were songs of protest. Uh, some of those songs were songs about love and Black identity and Black joy. And so even though I couldn't play music in this space, I thought it was still uh, important to put in um, soulful albums that kind of inspired our fam my family and connected it. And then also speak to other Black families that, you know, the familiar see that's the familiar part where you uh, are normalized because yeah aretha franklin fans you know mm -hmm. uh, are aretha franklin fans and most of them mostly i would assume are african-american so i wanted to draw in that connection at the same time 
But I also wanted to draw on that connection from the white gays because like black people, white people should know Aretha Franklin. <laughs> right. And so um, I was trying to draw those two parallels. But the, the, be- the thing about it was one parallel was like, oh yeah, let me listen to this again because I know it. The other parallel, the other side, you know, is let me listen to this because I'm familiar with it. But in saying familiar with it, I wanted you to experience my lived Black experience. And so uh, that's why my wife, who was like my partner in crime, put the Black woman's aesthetic on album to kind of blend in and say, hey, these themes, these discussions are all related to these albums, these soulful songs, these movements. There's movement in all these songs. So, yeah. Yeah, so I think that the entire installation to me feels exactly like what you're just saying, where it's a juxtaposition between things that are com- comfortable and familiar and things that are uncomfortable and traumatic. And you don't notice the discomfort and the trauma right away, even looking at the fridge right now. And then you see the reference to food deserts with the sand inside. But when you first come into the space, you see all these bright colors, you see the cool old refrigerator and, you know, that kind of feels nostalgic and everything. And um, I'm going to just pause it right here because it's a good shot of the overall space. Mm -hmm. And then the dinner table, which feels inviting. And um, and I'm going to let you talk in a second um, about the whole idea of audience um but i feel like covid if had covid not happened this installation is the perfect amount of interactive and engaging and then also just visual because there's a few pieces that are interactive for the audience and i'm just going to say them for anyone that hasn't been in the space yet so you have the record player you have the refrigerator that you can open, you have the table that you can sit at and write a name on, um, on the tablecloth. And I'll let you explain what that means. Um, you have the telephone, which is in the corner, um, in this image right now that you can pick up and hear some things. And then you have the TV. Um, and it's just, it's really a perfect, combination of interactive and also just like walking through a space and visualizing it. Um, But I do want to talk about this whole idea of audience. So a couple of weeks ago, I had a conversation with three of our um, art of activism artists and uh, the executive director of the Banneker Douglas Museum. And we talked a little bit about audience and I mentioned this installation and how you and I had had a conversation about um, that you had kind of when you were creating the this piece for your thesis that you had intended for it to be a white audience. And what I may or may not have done, hopefully I didn't, is um, gave people the assumption that this is only intended for a white audience because that's not the case. Um, so do you want to kind of dig a little deeper into that? I know I just said a lot. I think think you said that excellent. But (laughs) yeah, as I said, like, you know, this is a, this is a, so these artifacts, you know, in my household are normalized. What in, and in saying normalized, so there is the tragedy. So when you look at, or the trauma, when you look at the, the kitchen table, um, what uh, on the table, the closer you get, you start to see these names. Now, that was uh, a piece that I did, but it was, uh, I was supposed to be working on something completely different. I don't even remember what it was I was supposed to be working on at this point. Rolando Castile had just gotten a shot and I had just had a critique and I can't even remember the artist, the visiting artist that came in to see me because I was crying so severely. Uh, I don't even, it, like it is a blur. 
uh, the discussion I had with them. I really don't know if they were feeling the moment I was in, <laughs> you know, uh, because at that point I was scared. Philando was like my cousin, even though he's not my cousin for real, but it was like losing a family member. And I think I was just tired. So I had to find something to calm myself down. And I looked at my little art bucket and I found that I had a tablecloth. It was just a, a, a regular tablecloth from Dollar Tree. And I was like, this cheap thing. And I said, cheap, hmm, cheap. That is how our lives feel whenever we are gunned down in the way that we are. And so I just started writing and researching and writing. And I started re uh, researching states. The first exhibit I did, um, I had a Jewish poem on the wall and I had all, it seemed like 49 states. And those 49 states represented all the places that unarmed black people have been killed and then compounded with the table. Uh, where, where all these names are on it. And just the other, let's see, last year before doing another piece, I had to add 20 more names to that table. So it was just like, a, it felt like I was signing an obituary, but I do find uh, something soothing in writing and making marks to kind of calm and guide me when I'm working or thinking. So. Um, that's what I said that I must do. I must bring this issue to the table uh, and we must have a conversation uh, about uh, the people on the table. I didn't want the people to be forgotten. I didn't want them to be forgotten. And uh, inside that dish, I don't know if they saw that, I put, you know, the first original dish is I put uh, apple pie. So, you know, uh, you guys could have ate some of that pie. Because <laughs> I put it in there to see intentionally who was going to eat the apple pie. Because that was to say, oh, because we as a Black people, you know, it's very hard to get to this apple pie. So originally, when you see that square, that's where a pedestal sat. And the pedestal was intentionally high. And that's where the... Uh, cake pan or whatever set on top of the pedestal because my point was it is so hard to reach this apple pie we call America because you know there we can't we don't have duality in our identity but it feels as if you know we're not wanted here uh and we can't be equal and then we when unfamiliar with our home so it was a whole bunch of elements in there but then I, I was very, uh, I wanted to make sure I put those white angels around because then it made me think of the white Jesus that was sit on my grandma's wall with white angels. And it, it was a way of, again, when I thought about it, I said, putting those uh, images, imagery of white Jesus and the white angels made me think like Jesus was white when I was a kid. And so uh, I was addressing this notion of the, the, the savior, you know, the savior is uh, supposed to be, you know, whiteness. And, and, I, and I'm just saying this for truth speaking, not, you know, I know it might sound like a, a nail scratching on the board to non-Black uh, people, <laughs> but uh, it's just my way of, shedding light on the truth and if it comes off you know soft it's really didactic in the sense that there's something in those layers no i, I think what's fascinating about this is that i'm going to push play again um so it goes through again you know there's actually a lot of stuff in this room and while I kind of biasly think that it fits in the space absolutely perfectly, everything is intentional, even this. And I'm glad that we have this on video because 
there's probably some people that went through the space that didn't know you could lift that hand up, but um, a lot of it is uncomfortable. And I think your work more so than anybody else's in this exhibition, and a lot of them do this well, but yours more so than anyone's, you know, is a testament to the fact that art isn't necessarily supposed to just be something that's aesthetically pleasing for people. Um, it's meant for starting a dialogue and creating a discourse about things. And there's a time and a place for that, you know, for the pretty stuff and the things that you would want to have in your dining room. And there's a time and a place for talking about this right here, this, um, what is this piece called? The hair politics. Hair politics. Hair yeah. politics. Oh, you yeah. could have paused it on that blow dryer. Cause that, uh, you know, all those instruments, <laughs> all of Israel, I'm like, whoa, I remember, you know, the perm, you know, getting a relaxer mm -hmm. in my hair because it was the right thing to, you know, it was, taming this thick natural hair. So um, yeah, when I did this, like that right there was lose hair care. And mm -hmm. you know, I had already seen a documentary on how the Korean hair care market had extracted power from the black hair care market. And at one point in time, Los Angeles, California had the largest uh, black hair care market there was is somehow, you know, other cultures, uh, well, the Korean, uh, mostly Korean started getting into our products, even recreating some of the products and selling them. Um, and the thing about the black hair care market was, you know, those health care uh, those owners couldn't get access to fund funding in the way that uh, the Korean market could. And so that's that's like literally how, when we go around here in Maryland, we see all these hair care markets and you see a Korean guy standing behind the counter is because they have had even more access to financial means to get, uh, to have the ability to wholesale these products. And they even took, uh, I think that a documentary showed how they took uh, the recipe of how to create like a, a there was a, a curler that was like an iron curler and they recreated that and put their patent on top of it. So it, it was a very interesting uh, thing to study. Also, uh, I learned that the FDA does not monitor any chemicals that go in black hair care products. Oh. And, and some of the things like if anyone that's watching that has had a relaxer knows, you cannot leave a relaxer in your hair for longer than what? Five minutes, not even five minutes at that because that's how quick it straightens the, the coils in your hair. If you leave it in longer, you ended up burning your skin. So it makes strong. The chemicals in that hair care product were powerful to, enough to do that and then uh, burn your skin. But not on only on top of that, they said uh, because of these chemicals, they believe, they're not certain, but they believe that could be why Black women have the highest uh, uh, problems with thyroid condition. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a lot, it was a lot to, uh, that piece hair politics, yeah. those, those tries, I tried to go in on the politics, you know, and make these myth monsters. <laughs> and I feel like that piece is an ongoing piece. Yeah. 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 Well, that, that actually kind of gets to the last question that I had for you. And if, if you have other things that you want to talk about too, we can absolutely do that. But the last question I had was the idea that this exhibition is ever evolving because I believe is, is it the market blocks that were the new additions to the piece since your, since it was your thesis show? Let's yeah. see. I had, oh yeah, the auction block. 
Uh huh. Were, yeah. Were a part of another show, but I thought it also fit in this show. So that actually was three, but those wooden blocks are back breaking. So I only brought two. <laughs> I mean, they are very heavy, but uh, so that was a part of my auction block series that I did in my art show between ourselves. And I, you know, was talking about the ways at the time when Colin Kaepernick uh, took uh, his knee, it was so infuriating to see how he was blackballed in the NFL for speaking uh, the truth about what was happening in the community. And then the way I looked at the silence at the time of certain athletes, there were a minimal amount of athletes that uh, participated, but then only Colin and another athlete actually got uh, blackballed from the uh, NFL as a whole. And so I was just uh, like blown away at that. And I was like the way that we would get up on this auction block. And that's the way I viewed it over time. You know, uh, I understand that we're trying to get away from poverty and other issues, but some issues of trauma are internalized as well. And even in the midst of you wanting to get into it, you would be uh, still willing to get up on that auction block and uh, be bought the way you are, even though you're getting like a, a piece of, um, of, of money uh, and it helped you get to this one level. I was, I was thinking at the time, around Colin Kaepernick, so I'll be specific. That is what came to mind because it infuriated me that he could not tell the truth uh, uh, and just be uh, received for telling the truth. Uh, he couldn't take a knee, you know, for doing, you know, even though he was advised to take a knee and stand in the gap for People, because right now people, you know, black men and women were getting violated, shot, and no one was taking a, a stance from that platform. And Colin did. And I really appreciated that because that reminded me of Muhammad Ali, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Jim Brown, and all those other athletes who would stand in the gap and say, no, we're going to march with Martin, Martin Luther King. We're going to move to... Uh, get the Civil Rights Act passed. I even remember watching a video of Jim Brown. I don't know if it was the Ed Sullivan show or he was actually having a conversation with a senator from Georgia uh, having those discussions about, you know, inferiority in Blackness and uh, suppression. And so I, I commend uh, Kaepernick for what he did and, and and this was my show of solidarity of you know what Colin was saying even though he too got on the auction block he then in turn uh, turned his platform back to say hey look you know these things are happening uh, to this black community our community and no one saying anything and he had the will and the power to stand up and uh, speak up using his powerful platform. Well, wow. I mean, you know, what's super interesting is that we have one of the eight artists is Aaron Maven, who is a former NFL player as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually walked through the, the galleries with him and walk, we walked through your installation and we talked a little bit about that. Um, and he's somebody who played football for five years in the NFL and then left to become an art educator and an activist and a full-time artist in, in Baltimore. So um, it's very interesting. Um, I'm going to push play. <laughs> and is there anything else that we didn't cover? I mean, we could talk about this all night. <laughs> right. It, but, you, know, my, you know, that last piece when bad Christians happen to good people, that was my mother's book um, because, you know, faith, faith and religion also flow in, in, in the black household, maybe not all, but I, you know, 
recently I had the opportunity to watch the uh, documentary by Henry Louis Gates on the black church. And it, it did everything I needed it to do in terms of how, you know, we talk about this, uh, this uh, loving, you know, we talk about our loving God and how he should be to people and then how people should treat people. But then when it comes to these issues of social justice, these so-called Christians, you know, will in turn uh, be bad to good people like, like Colin. They will say, well, he does not need to play football because he's speaking against the American flag. I, I, dis I, I, I don't agree with that. Um, or, you know, to put on blinders as if these uh, events are not happening to unarmed black people. Oh, sorry, my cat machine going off. <laughs> uh, and so we have a, a cat feeder that's automatic. Um, and so it leads me to like something recent that occurred. It was sent to me. It was a, a kid was stopped by uh, a young man was walking to the store. He looked over to his right. He saw cop cars whoosh by, but they stopped. And the only excuse the officers could give, now this was like two weeks ago, the only, only excuse the officer could give was because his eyes got big. So that was a reason for you to slam him down to the ground and give him a concussion and bust his head open because his eyes got big. And so these things, uh, matter and and that is what my space is calling into question like yes these things look uh, aesthetically pleasing and culturally refined but when you dig into dig into uh, the things behind those uh, those tropes uh, it's asking you to do something not you know black people the, the one thing I do want to say about this show is the first show, because I had a, it was a lot of people that came to this show. Um, and so what I can say, and I should have recorded it, was how comfortable Black people were in the space. When they came into the space, let's just say I had food. Food was on the outside. But they walked into the space. Strangers and Black people I didn't even know walked into the space, sat at the table sat in the chairs, sat anywhere in the art studio because they felt like it was a living a living space. So seeing Black people sit in that space like that uh, intuitively was amazing. When non-Black people walked into the space, they looked at it exactly for what they were reading. It was an exhibition. It was this, you know, uh, these items are, how do I look at this? Or, you know, and so I think when I think of what I want my work to do, I, I kind of want my work to like cause non-Black people and people of color to come into that space in the same way that you see us Black people in the space, sit down with us, talk with us, engage with us, see the comfortability in us, but know that in that, com that comfort is layers of trauma also. Like uh, the untold stories of uh, Black people are in those gestures. But they're sitting there because, oh yeah, you know, I, I, I know Black churches have been burned. And you know, and they sit there kind of like not to uh, kick it out of their head. Like, oh, you know, it, it's not that we don't care. It's just that how normal it is an everyday. It is something we see. It is something we feel like, um, and maybe some of us don't, maybe, but you know, younger generations, of black people maybe not experience uh, 
you know, the KKK and other groups in that way. Uh, but when I saw the insurrection on January 6th, I too was like, this is nothing new to me because I've seen it. I've seen it up close and I knew all along would make America great men, you know? And then of course the generations before me, they also knew. So, ah, that's well, what I well, I think you really have done a beautiful job visualizing in this installation you know, your experience as a black woman, I feel, um, I feel different every time I go in the space to be completely honest. And I feel like I pick up on different things every time I go on this, in the space. And um, it's really been great for me to talk with you about it a couple of different times. I think um, people that watch this are going to really just be so impacted by your words and your feelings and just everything that you've done. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. And um, I hope that anybody that wants to come see um, Nikki Brooks's installation from the hold of the ship, um, you have two more times to do it again on Wednesday from 3.30 to 6 p.m. Um, or Friday from 3.30 to 6.30 p.m. So thank you again, Nikki. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, Emily, for this opportunity to talk about it. <laughs> awesome. All right. I'm going to...